Welcome to Encounters. Uh, today we have a guest from Hong Kong, uh, Professor Chin Chuan Li or CC Li. But we also have uh, a live audience uh, because uh, this is part of uh, a visit by uh, Chinese and uh, Asian scholars uh, who are attending a, a conference uh, on the theme of the future of US-China media communication and public diplomacy. Welcome to everybody. But uh, my main guest today is uh, Professor Lee, whom I uh, met in a book form uh, uh, quite a number of years ago. I, I recall that the book was published in 1980 mm -hmm. on uh, cultural imperialism revisited. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was one of the first books I found which were quite uh, critical about what is normally today called uh, Western mm. mass media and the way the West looks at the rest of the world. Uh, you address the topic of uh, what's so homogenizing of uh, TV in, in those days. And since we've learned that indeed uh, the concept of homogenization is uh, uh, not really to, uh, to be used as a, as a valid concept, mm -hmm. but you also were one of the first who started uh, critiquing uh, the more traditional modernization mm -hmm. perspective uh, as it is being presented still up to today uh, by people like Daniel Lerner and Wilbur Schramm, etc. So that was my, my first uh, introduction to you. Uh, of course, since we've uh, met a couple of mm -hmm. times, I know that you are the uh, chair professor and the head of the School of Media and Communication at the City University of uh, Hong Kong. But before you were also linked to uh, the University of uh, Minnesota. Uh, so you have uh, lived and worked here for uh, mm -hmm. quite a while. Mm -hmm. You have been uh, the chair of the uh, Department of Communication at the Chinese University in Hong Kong, which uh, is also a well-recognized uh, and well-established uh, university. And maybe even more important, from a, a historical perspective, you were also the founding president of mm -hmm. the Chinese Communication Association, which since has become quite uh, well-known and quite well-established. What's the importance of such an association? Why? Is a Chinese association necessary or needed? When, well, thank you very much for inviting me. This is a privilege to appear on your show. And uh, I, I don't know what I'm going to say. But when I was a graduate student, I find myself uh, pretty alone when I go to, uh, went to uh, uh, international professional conferences. And there aren't any, there weren't any Asian faces around. and. Uh, and gradually there are more and more people and I thought we should really get together at least to exchange information to form some sort of alliance and to explore the possibilities uh, for collaboration but more importantly to establish a sense of problematic consciousness about and to make culture count to make international uh, communication research culturally relevant mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure we have something to contribute in that regard and that's how uh, the uh, Chinese Communication Association uh, started out. And gradually we gather more and more people and it's becoming professionally fairly prominent mm -hmm. and associated with uh, major international communication uh, associations. And we always are given the spaces and the opportunity to organize panels. Mm -hmm. I think one of the important goals is really to set some agenda uh, in terms of what kind of research we want to do, what kind of question we should ask. And I should emphasize, on the one hand, we reject the sort of Western calm dominant view. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we should also reject the kind of nativistic uh, view. I've, I've never been a believer of Chinese exceptionalism. And the reason being that you know, social science is really an art of managing the tension between generality and specificity. Right. And culture is very important. But cultural, pro, uh, uh, we don't want to get into cultural isolation and stay in a cultural cocoon. That's not my purpose at all. Just because the Western domination never take other cultures into consideration. What we need is to 
really formulate certain pragmatic consciousness in our research and hopefully meet with the larger literature, the larger community of scholars, and finally emerge with a view that enriches and broaden uh, our understanding about how things work. And I think this is how I believe uh, communi what communication is supposed to be or what international collaboration uh, is all about. Mm -hmm. So yes, last year you organized a conference on internationalizing international yes. communication and your goal was obviously to question the current status of international mm -hmm. communication. Mm -hmm. You wanted to add another perspective, mm -hmm. a more Asian perspective, mm -hmm. but what do you mean by that? What's so specific about an Asian or a Chinese perspective? Well, let me say this. I taught at the University of Minnesota for 20 years uh, and I taught international communication and I knew that in America, uh, international is always defined by default as non-American. Mm -hmm. And so international student means foreign student. And international communication, in a very unfortunate sense, may mean non-US communication. And that's Indeed, wrong. Yeah. I mean, we are talking about a globalizing world. And, you know, you, we have to make culture a very important factor. And culture does you know, matter. Our culture is not only an antecedent or consequence of sociological or psychological variables. Now, we have to take cultural interpretation and the meanings very, very seriously. And it is in that sense that we have to reflect on our own cultural experiences. In this case, let's say the Chinese cultural experiences. And I don't mean Chinese interp the interpretation of Chinese experience is homogeneous. Right. We should allow internal differences, but speak with the same Chinese accent and then engage with other scholars from other cultures. And uh, hopefully uh, we, we can uh, strike a better balance. Uh, Could you I, give an example of uh, such kind of contribution to be made from a Chinese perspective? You know, let's say the you know, China is going through all kinds of transformation, which you never see in other countries. And I don't want to make it sound as if it's the only country that's going through the changes, but there must be certain areas that are really very common to, let's say, uh, to the former Soviet bloc or mm. to other third world countries. But there is something that is uniquely Chinese uh, at this time and space. And so we really have to reflect on, let's say, the Chinese uh, media system. How do you describe the current Chinese media system? There's no such category. There's no such a uh, uh, typology. And so, for example, I sort of uh, uh, borrow this concept from Latin American studies. Uh, 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 corporatism, uh, corporatism, yeah. uh, party state corporatism. But in China, it's not only the party state anymore. It's the party and market corporatism. And make it sort of palatable to mm -hmm. analysis of the Chinese media, uh, but be at the same time in tune with the larger literature. And therefore, the Chinese experiences gets considered in the larger, uh, in the larger part of things. Yeah, I know that you emphasize uh, Confucianism and uh, the typical uh, Chinese contribution mm -hmm. to uh, the discourse these days quite quite heavily, and I think that that's a good way of of, of exploring this in a, in dialogue with others. Uh, but do you think that uh, you have or Chinese scholars have succeeded in making the point and putting it on the no, agenda? No, I don't think so. I, I, this is this is a long way to go, uh, and I have to emphasize Confucianism is a sort of lively has lively history and open to different interpretations. When such things a a doctrine, a sort of ethos that's been practiced by so many people for 2,000 years, then you have local adaptations. There's no one single right. interpretation of Confucianism. And therefore, I reject Li Kuang Yu's you know, version of Asian values mm -hmm. or the kind of Confucian institute that we hear so much about. Right. There's, we should not uh, believe that there's only one, and let alone, officially sanctioned interpretations of Confucianism or any kinds of uh, cultural values. I really take this, you know, take this uh, 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 
cultural interpretations from Robin Williams uh, mm -hmm. seriously. The culture is a lived and living experience. So it's not frozen it's in fluid, museums. It's in progress, no, yeah. And it's not sort of sanctioned by officials or by propaganda department. And that's why it allows for very varied and heterogeneous and different kinds of interpretations and mm -hmm. lots of, you know, contestation actually uh, and accommoda accommodation and, you know, struggle. So you are all in favor of dialogue, debate? Yes. And there is not really one ultimate uh, opinion or conclusion to mm -hmm. be drawn? Even among this group, we have diverse opinions. That doesn't prevent us from reaching some sort of understanding mm -hmm. while preserving uh, our differences. We harbor no illusion that there will be complete consensus, which is inhumane and inhuman. We, we are not you know, striving for, for that. Mm -hmm. What we need is to have certain common concerns. There are certain critical issues that are facing our own living and lived ex experiences. Right. And how do we reflect from these set of experiences and come up with most creative and critical questions and put on the table and make some research, investigation, and then contribute to the larger you know, dialogue, the process right. of dialogue. And we have to force ourselves, <laughs> you know, force ourselves upon the Western colleagues uh, not to ignore us because now we have, you know, you have we journals, have, yeah, you we have, have associations, research, conferences. Research achievements. Mm -hmm. That's something not for you to ignore. Right, but do you think that you have already reached the point of uh, the same level of uh, co connection so that they are also listening we to what you have to contribute? No, 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 we can never be sort of on parity with Western scholars. Mm -hmm. It's still very dominant. But I think the situation is much improved now than when I sort of first entered the field. Mm -hmm. And for example, nowadays when graduate students come to the United States and they write a dissertation on things that are Chinese or something, uh, no more question will be asked about the value of that kind of thing. You know, otherwise, in the, in the past, people would say, why do you want to do that? And uh, as if the uh, United States were the, wor the, the world. It's like the kind of World Series version of communication. Yes. But do you think that the United States or American scholars realize this, that the times are changing? Uh, I, I hope so, uh, but it's only very... I hope this uh, Asian, uh, this uh, financial crisis will make them more aware. I do have a lot of colleagues talking about the globalization of, of academic research. Mm -hmm. By globalization, I hope they don't mean that they take the American hypotheses, American perspectives, and reproduce them somewhere in the imperial corner of the globe. I, I hope you know that. That would be a wrong way to, to, uh, to go. Although it has been for a long time yes. that American s students or uh, American uh, scholars and Chinese scholars, to take that example, who studied here, yes. they went back and they reproduced American oh, yeah, yeah. perspectives. That's, uh, because that's the easiest. Hmm. That's the easiest. To understand yourself is a very, very difficult, difficult thing. And of course, to understand the rich body of knowledge in the Western tradition is very, very tough challenge. You know? Putting things together, you know, both set of uh, tasks together, of course, you know, it's a lifetime kind of struggle. Right. Yeah, if I may go back to uh, the situation in, in China, this Chinese community of scholars, uh, critics or uh, uh, especially li people living in this part of the world, they would say, but can you create that kind of space for dialogue given what they then would call the oppressive nature of the system mm -hmm. or of the, uh, the country? Uh, what, uh, how do you deal with that? In, in what sense? In, in, the, in, the, in, in the scientific community. Or uh, Chinese scholars, communication scholars at uh, liberty uh, to follow your path and uh, uh, be free in uh, these oh, kind okay, of uh, okay. discussions. I, I think there, uh, I think there are two implications. For those people who don't live inside China, we, we do have complete freedom in choosing uh, what we want to we want to study, mm -hmm. and and therefore we are not really bound by the we are not dictated by uh, the political decrees, or uh, we don't necessarily have to follow the Western trend. Uh, of course. 
we still have to be conversant with the larger literature right. because knowledge uh, is public. Uh, but for those people who live inside China, of course, there are politically there are political restrictions, and but I do hope that there's a sense of you know problem consciousness consciousness. You can study certain issues that are less bound by political taboo, mm -hmm. or uh, you can get around it uh, in a number of different ways. But we, what we need is to really reflect on your own lived and living experiences, rather than replicate, reproduce whatever that you learn in the United States. I, uh, let me, if I can, I can poke fun at this and, and make a joke. Agenda setting probably has produced more jobs and more dissertation than anything in the world. And right. so you go back to China and then be the dead horse and do agenda setting, uh, 100 articles, and then uh, find out 70% uh, of the articles replicate or confirm the American hypothesis, and 30% uh, do not confirm the hypothesis. My question would be, why doing that? Indeed. So. Can you answer the question why? Well, because it's easy. You know, it's as if, for, and that's why it's important to build some sort of a sense of self-confidence. And therefore, you need to have a community of scholars who talk about this sort of thing instead of saying, OK, I've been in the United States, and I study with someone. So I imported uh, these things as if uh, right. this were the only thing yeah. available in the world. And that, that's the wrong way to go. I mean, the Chinese scholars really have to build a sense of self-confidence. And of course, that doesn't, necess doesn't mean that they have to isolate. Uh, it goes both ways. Right. They have to open themselves to the larger community of scholars outside. At the same time, reflect on their experiences. And the conversions of the two, I think, point to a new way. Right, uh, as you rightly point out, it's a, a mutual uh, understanding and also therefore it needs uh, some uh, commitment from both sides yes. in order to reach uh, that level where you can take it further and uh, discuss uh, the real stuff rather than uh, the opposing positions, mm -hmm. uh, which are unfortunately too often what we see on TV and what is being uh, reported in the news. If I, if I may go back to the conference uh, you mm -hmm. invited me to, uh, uh, internationalizing international communication. Uh, of course, it's an ongoing debate, mm -hmm. uh, as we both uh, agree. But what would you expect the outcome of, of this process to be, both in a practical f way, but maybe also in a theoretical way? In a, ther a theoretical way, because I at least I try to provide a, a forum, a, mm -hmm. a platform, and whereby people from different uh, uh, cultural backgrounds and well-trained scholars and the, uh, the leading scholars uh, could congregate, could sit down and really talk about these things. And there are some differences. That's okay. It, the differences are a healthy thing. Mm -hmm. and, but we're also trying to build up certain understanding. And the next, it seems to me, uh, we have to move to South and South dialogue. Right now, we're trying to have a North and South dialogue. But even among the South, because of a center and peripheral relationship, we all look to North America and to Europe, and we don't talk to other fellow uh, third world countries. And for example, Asia and Eastern Europe or Latin America. I mean, there's certain experiences that are very valuable to each other. Let's say authoritarianism the decline, the democratization in Latin America, and the revival of feudalism. You know, all these uh, uh, very oscillating cycles uh, can be very important for, for China. And let's say if we talk about uh, the transformation of the media and uh, the economic reform and so on, uh, then we certainly can make a very important comparison between China, Chinese experiences with the former Soviet Union you know, bloc uh, mm. in uh, Central and, and Eastern Europe. And not only so, uh, let's take the more author right-wing authoritarian countries uh, in Asia, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, right. uh, there's certain further implications. And then Latin America. And therefore, it's truly international. 
there are certain issues that are so common there are, uh, that really uh, are the common challenges for mm -hmm. people everywhere, except that there are also some unique experiences that have to be factored in, right. and so that we have a broader understanding of how things work. But therefore you need to start uh, from an equal footing, so yes. to speak, so yes. that there's no dominance of one of, paradigm yes. against the other. And, and that predicated on our own self-confidence and problem consciousness. At the same time, we need to present, them, present uh, to the world, this is our research uh, achievements. We right. do have something to show. It's not slogan. Right. If I, if I may challenge you a bit further, uh, I recall from that uh, conference, which was in itself very, uh, very interesting and very uh, useful, uh, but most of the papers, especially those presented by Westerners, they were basically reproducing European scholarly thinking, uh, Habermas, Bourdieu, Foucault. And so now being in America, you uh, had the sense as if nothing is happening here except uh, adaptations of uh, European thought. And it's, mm -hmm. it's always this kind of uh, coming and going of uh, different streams. Mm -hmm. But what would you highlight or what, what kind of scholars would you identify in the Asian context, which, which should also be considered uh, important? That's, that's very important because of the Habermas of this p the concept of public sphere, mm -hmm. and someone, one of the uh, participants wrote about it and in a very lucid way. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me, in our field, we tend to appropriate certain concepts unthinkingly and very crudely. And uh, we happen to have a very lucid and uh, very good uh, uh, interpreter right. of Habermas and Foucault and, and, and all that. I, I really appreciate that. But the next step is to see, okay, how sh can we apply and use this concept uh, suitably mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and productively? And I've just written a, uh, an article, unfortunately this is written in Chinese, uh, uh, to be published in a book. Uh, and to reflect on the meaning of public sphere and to what extent public sphere can be used to analyze uh, the press history in Shanghai because the, the Heidelberg uh, scholars are trying to fit the Shanghai experience into the theoretical straitjacket of Habermas, which I totally object. And I, I think there, I mean, it was a really a twist of the data and ex experience. I, and therefore, I try to discuss that. And so, public shifia is a very important concept as an organizing concept. But is and it also applicable to China or well, to Shanghai? And that's where we, we re, that if we use that as a starting point to ask yes. questions, it's not a point of return necessarily. We use this as a starting point to ask creative, in, ingenious questions and then look for empirical evidence. Then we can make certain assessment whether public sphere uh, is there or not, or you know, is, if it's there, how much, in what forms, mm -hmm. how, uh, to what extent it was different from the Western experiences. So it's no harm if we use that as a starting point to ask questions, instead of thinking that it, you know, it has to be uh, concluded that way. Okay, now if, if we bring it down to the level of uh, education, mm -hmm. if we uh, would have to design an ideal type kind of course on international communication. What would you like to mention as the ingredients for such a course? Boy, I've never thought about it. You know, of course, there, the major, Je Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Tunstall used to wrote a, a fine book called The Media American, yes. but his second book has, uh, has a revised opinion. Right. Uh, the, the media were American, and I don't agree with him on that point. Uh, at least in terms of the media theory, the media literature remains Anglo-American, American first, and uh, with the British uh, as a sort of junior partner. Right. And we have to respect that because that, and there are a lot of important things for us to learn, but while we learn the literature, we have to be very careful, and you know, I think Errol Said is a very inspiring example for me. Orientalism, yeah. Control, pardon, contra panel reading. I mean, you try to read it alternatively or even oppositionally. You know, the literature is there, but you give it a different interpretations according to your own understanding or your own you know, cultural right. uh, heritage. And I think that would be a very fr fruitful way to, uh, to go. And so 
first of all, in terms of uh, the curriculum, we need major theories uh, uh, of the media that was originally produced in the United States and uh, Britain or in, in Europe. But we have to read it very carefully. The most important challenge is to understand our own cultural roots. Unfortunately, not too many people, uh, not too many students of today uh, would care to go back to understand our own history, our own culture. And that's really very tough. And that's why it has to build on broader understanding of liberal arts. It's not only the communication. It's a you, social scientific yeah, environment. Yeah, and, yeah. and humanities too. You yeah. have to understand the culture. You have to understand at least some part of, a, some part of literature mm -hmm. and some philosophy. And then come back to uh, sort of problematize it in mm. social science, science, uh, science way. Right. But we need to have a certain humanistic underpinning uh, instead of, uh, to, in order to ask uh, culturally relevant and creative questions. That's a nice way to conclude uh, our discussion uh, because that's what I think is indeed needed. Uh, the cultural perspective needs to be given much more importance, not on, only in our education, but also in, in our interaction as scholars. Uh, do you think that that's an achievable goal? An it's a matter of, ex it's a matter of uh, degree rather than a uh, it's not a matter of a kind. Of course, it can be achieved to a certain extent, and we always have to uh, uh, try to achieve that goal. So it's work in progress. Yeah, so it will be a work in progress forever. Right. Okay, thank you for your... My pleasure. Your thank thoughts. you very much. And thank you for your interest.